Hey, I'm Gretchen Men, and welcome to a collaboration I'm doing with Breed Love Guitars. This is part one of a series on an introduction to finger picking. This lesson will be primarily for anyone new to the technique, but also could be useful for anyone wanting to strengthen some fundamentals. In this first lesson, I'll be going over some basics. Hand position, finger movement, free strokes and rest strokes, finger independence, tone, walking you through a series of exercises that will serve you well as a foundation, but also in part two, and then I'll leave you with some recommendations for practice. This video is divided up into chapters to make it easier to skip around and revisit sections. Part two, we'll be putting some of these basics to use and will be a step-by-step -step guide to learning a beautiful Led Zeppelin instrumental. And if you can't wait to know what it is, then give a listen to physical graffiti to get a clue. This is a Breedlove Pursuit Concert Nylon. It has Western red cedar top, and Myrtlewood back and sides. This felt like the perfect guitar to introduce this series as I started on classical guitar and my right hand technique derives largely from that discipline. So for anyone who loves the sound of nylon strings like I do, but wants kind of a versatile crossover guitar, this is a great instrument. So in addition to the nylon strings, typically uh, classical guitars will have a wider nut, meaning more distance between the strings, which can take a little bit of getting used to, but you can do any of these exercises on any guitar. So steel string, electric, classical, really whatever you have. I wanna be clear that there are countless incredible guitar players whose finger style technique differ from mine, in, in some cases substantially. So take none of what I say is dogmatic. These are just suggestions and information on how I was taught and what works for me, but it's really about what works for you. I will say that a basic classical technique though is not a bad place to start. It puts a lot of focus and energy into tone production, efficiency of movement, finger independence, and injury prevention. All good things. Okay, let's talk nails versus no nails. Many people use nails, some people don't. I'm in the no nails category. It's just how I was taught and I'm happy with the tones and dynamic range I am able to get this way, but because I haven't spent any time playing with nails, I can't really provide a fair and balanced assessment of the virtues and drawbacks of either choice. I will say that I love never worrying about nail maintenance or nail breakage, but if you love playing with nails or you're curious to try it, then go for it. What I'm gonna be showing you here does not commit you to either choice. In classical guitar, the instrument is placed on the left leg and supported by the right. The steel string or electric, it kind of go either way. And I'll often vary my position based on, you know, just how long I've been playing in the other one. So I'll switch it up for comfort. But in either case, your arm of your picking hand will rest on the body of the guitar and you want your hand to fall into a natural playing position. So if you have it up too far here, you're going to be reaching for the strings. If you have it too far down here, you're going to have your wrist at an unnatural angle. Depending on the length of your arm, you're just going to have to find where that nice spot is where your, your hand kind of just falls in a relaxed position right over the strings and adjust your hand position so that your thumb and your first fingers all have their own space and aren't colliding. A really common first thing to do is that people will kind of be a little flat like this and then your first finger, or then your fingers and your thumb will kind of collide. By stretching your thumb just a little bit towards the nut of the guitar, um, not, not so much that you're at an unnatural angle, but just enough that you can have this kind of movement and be able to play and not collide with your other fingers is what you're after. So the movement, and this is maybe one of the least intuitive things, the movement should come from this, this first joint here. So instead of feeling like, like clawing the strings, which is primarily this second joint here, the idea should be more like, like waving. <laughs> um, and, and it should be this kind of full movement where any movement in the, um, these other smaller joints are more just sort of a follow through byproduct, but the primary movement comes from here. The tendency is to, to want to do this plucking movement more, I think, because we feel like we have more control, but you're gonna get better sound and better uh, ergonomics having the movement come from the larger joint. So rest strokes versus free strokes. A rest stroke is when you pluck the string and then the finger comes to rest on the next adjacent string. And it can be used to give a note a particular weight or accent, and you can do it with any finger. So an example of a rest stroke would be like this. That's with a thumb. So plucking the low E string and coming to rest on the A string here. For example, you could do it with any, any string. And same with your finger, say first finger on the G string coming to rest on the D string. You could do the same thing with your middle finger, the same thing with your ring finger. Now, 
Now, a free stroke is what most of us intuitively use, meaning just plucking the string freely, so not coming to rest on any of the adjacent strings. So free stroke would be like that with the E string, and then I'll just go free stroke on the G string with my first finger, free stroke on the B string with my middle finger, free stroke on the E string with my ring finger. Okay, so finger independence. Just as the term suggests, the ability to move and control each finger separately is something we really want to cultivate. And until you've spent time working to grow that skill, some of the fingers are gonna feel almost inextricably intertwined. But the exercises coming up will help get the process started. In fingerstyle guitar, we typically use our thumb, which is notated as the letter P, index, which is I, middle, which is M, and ring finger, which is A. Some styles will use the pinky, but it's way less common, and I just suggest you start here in the more traditional fingers used. And if your muses call upon you to incorporate the pinky, then the principles that we're going over here will still be the same. There are a number of factors that contribute to tone. The position of your hand on the string, so closer to the bridge, is going to give you a brighter tone, and closer to the fretboard is going to give you a warmer tone. The type of motion across the strings, like the clawing of the strings will give you, it'll cause them to slap back sometimes on the fretboard and it'll give a more percussive and less resonant sound, which can be useful in some cases, but I wouldn't recommend it as your default. And if you want bigger, warmer tones, actually a slight press down, down towards the body is going to give you like a bigger, fuller sound. How much of your fingertip or nail you use and the speed of it across the strings, not to be confused with the tempo, but actually the quickness of the motion. Also your ears and your taste. Tone in large part is a result of subtle and even subconscious choices that you make in order to get the sounds that your ears like to hear. So if you want to develop great tone, you must play slowly enough in your practice that you have the space to really pay attention to it. It's not to be underestimated. Good tone comes primarily from your brain, through your hands, and then of course, out of your guitar. Okay, let's go through a series of exercises. So exercise one is gonna be between the thumb and the first finger. And I'm suggesting you just take your left hand out of the equation entirely and just focus on say the low E string and the G string. Now the motion is going to be, we're gonna start with the free strokes. You can do rest strokes too and interchange them. We're gonna hit the low E string, and we're gonna move from this joint here, not crunching these two fingers together, but giving them enough space to move. And then we're going to, I have my first finger actually already planted on the G string, and then I'm gonna pluck. Now the idea between each pluck is that you relax. And that's a hugely important aspect of this. Pluck, relax, pluck, relax. So your hand is always kind of falling back to this really relaxed position. So exercise one. Exercise two is going to be the same thing between the thumb and the middle finger. So I'm just having the middle finger be on the B string, and we're going to go free strokes between low E. Remembering to relax. As soon as you plug the note, relax. Exercise three will be the thumb and the ring finger. E string. You may find the ring finger to be the most weak of the fingers. Typically it will be, so just be patient, take your time with it, and know that it will eventually gain its own independence through these exercises. Now if you want to do any of those exercises with rest strokes, I suggest probably starting with the rest stroke in the thumb. You can do it with any of the other fingers as well, but maybe start going rest stroke with the thumb, free stroke with the first finger, and then rest stroke with the thumb, free stroke with the middle finger, and then. So for exercise three, we're gonna do a pattern. Thumb, index, middle, ring finger. So that would be P, I, M, A. 
And as you do this exercise, again, just think, relax, relax, relax. One of the things you also may notice is that some of the notes might want to pop out a little bit more and that has to do with just your fingers learning how to balance the tone and the volume between them all. So let your ears guide you in terms of um, how the tone sounds and, and strive for a certain balance both of uh, tone quality as well as volume. The next exercise will be a partial reversal of the previous one. We'll still start with a thumb, but then we're going to go ring finger, middle finger, first finger. Again. Really relaxing between each pluck. Move on to simultaneous and we'll try thumb and index finger at the same time and the motion for this is like like that that's why you want to give yourself enough space so thumb and index relax thumb and index relax and then the next exercise thumb and middle relax thumb and middle and then the last one thumb and ring thumb and ring We'll go all four together. So next we'll do thumb and index finger, middle, ring. Then we'll do recommend that you take your time and practice these with full focus. If you practice mistakes, you'll get good at them. So focus on quality, not quickness. High quality practice is slower and more deliberate than you might think and probably requires more engagement than most other things in your typical day. The quickness will be a natural outgrowth of good practice, so have faith it will come. But I want to break this down into specifics and I've included a one week practice recommendation and only requires about 20 minutes per day. So if you can get yourself to stick to this for two weeks, that's even better, but I recommend at least a week of devoted attention to good habits before going on to video two. I even created a practice tracker for you, which you can download by clicking in the link in the video description. So day one, 15 minutes only, exercises one to three, set a metronome to a very slow tempo, like 60 beats per minute, and set a timer for five minutes per exercise. Try to cultivate an almost meditative frame of mind as you go through each exercise, working to really hear everything and balancing the tone. And what I want you to do is with each click, don't just have one note per click. I'm actually suggesting that you do one note per, per every other click. So a note on the click and then one click for resting. So exercise one would sound like this. If you're really excited to keep working, you can repeat that for the day. But otherwise, after 15 minutes, you're done with day one. So for day two, 20 minutes this time, exercises four and five, same thing, five minutes each. But this time you're gonna do two 10 minute sessions. So you'll revisit it, the same two exercises after a break or later in the day. Day three will be 20 minutes again, going through exercises six through nine. Day four, 20 minutes again, exercises 10 and 11. Do 10 minutes for both, twice for a total of 20 minutes and take a little break between the practice sessions. Day four, 20 minutes, exercises 10 and 11. Days five, six, and seven, 20 minutes. Review all of the exercises. Spend at least two minutes on any that are easy and maybe a full five minutes on those that are more challenging. Then if you're really feeling good, go for it again. And I've made some suggestions on how to continue to work in the document that I have attached for your practice log. However you work, remember to go slowly, remember to listen carefully, 
And remember to be very, very patient. Don't hurry through this. It's really important to have a strong technical foundation and that's gonna expedite anything that you learn in the future. Once things are feeling more fluent, move on to step two, which is my favorite way to really solidify a new technique once I've laid the necessary groundwork, and that's to use it in a song. So that's coming up in part two. Let all your hard work pay off. It's going to be a good payoff. Don't be afraid to revisit sections of this lesson. Deeper learning and good habits are all about meaningful repetition. I'll see you in the next video. Good luck with it. Mm -hmm.